Welcome all. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, we're so pleased that you can be with us today for this withdrawal town hall. Um, my name is James. Some of you might know me as the host of the Madden America podcast. And for those kind of new to this, Madden America is um, a, a webzine whose mission is to rethink psychiatric care through a social discussion. And we do this via science reporting, blogs, personal stories, and events such as this one that you're with us for now. So if you are interested, then please do visit us at maddenamerica.com. And our event today is being co-run with our partners, the International Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, and we'll hear a little bit more about that in a minute. And um, before we kind of get into the, um, the exciting stuff of the panel today, um, joining me to run the event today and do all the really, really important stuff are um, Lucy and Karina. And uh, would you like to um, kind of say hello and, uh, you know, give the necessary bits and pieces? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Lucy Fernandez. Um, I have experience of psychiatric drug withdrawal, uh, quite a combination of psychiatric drugs, and I've been off them for over six years now. Um, but I still get so much from talking to other people, other survivors who've been through it and um, hearing their stories. So I'm so excited about today's discussion. Um, I'm the administrator for the International Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. Uh, we were founded in 2017 um, by a global network of experts, experts in lots of different ways. So many people with lived experience, but also researchers, clinicians, um, and writers, a range of people. Um, we're a registered UK charity, um, so we're a non-profit. Our aims are um, to support research and practice-based knowledge about safe withdrawal, um, to promote the human right to informed consent around psychiatric drugs, and also to, to stress the importance of uh, family members and friends and other, like, supporters in people's lives, and I'm sure many of you here today will kind of identify with that. Um, if you want to know more about IOPDW, it's iopdw.org, uh, where you can watch a video about um, practical methods for antidepressant withdrawal um, and lots of other resources. Thanks, Lucy. Um, so I'm Karina. I'm a business operations professional, and I work with Mad in America. Um, I, this event is really near and dear to my heart um, because I experienced um, a severe and protracted withdrawal myself. Um, I've been off about two and a half years now, but I actually found um, Michael and Gemma, who you'll hear from uh, during the depths of the withdrawal, and they just gave me so much hope to keep going. Um, and then I found Brooke after, I wish I had found her earlier, but she has an amazing story and she has so many parallels to my story. And we actually have the same birthday, which is funny too, <laughs> the exact same day. Um, so I, yeah, I spent uh, 22 years actually on an SSRI. I was um, medicated. My mother was diagnosed with brain cancer at 13. And I was experiencing anxiety at the time um, and just, yeah, sp spent 22 years uh, on it. And yeah, now I'm off, off of it. Yeah. Um, so there was a, in that I tapered over a six month period and I wish that I had had a video from IIPDW. Um, Lucy will drop the link in the chat, but it's actually shows you how to, how to taper safely. And that would have been really useful. So I wanted to mention that. Great. Thank you, Karina. And thank you, Lucy. Um, so yeah, before we, um, get to meet today's fantastic panel, I just wanted to share with you a little bit about what we'd like to do today. So this is our sixth withdrawal town hall and. In the previous five events, we talked a lot about the problems and difficulties encountered during withdrawal. And I, I think that Lucy, at some point in the chat, will share a link to a YouTube playlist where you can see the other discussions that we had. So, But this time, we wanted to host an event to look at successful stories where people had been through difficult experiences with psychiatric drugs, but have transcended that experience and come out the other side. Now, we know that there will be some of you with us today who don't feel that you've gotten to where you want to be on a, a withdrawal or tapering journey. And 
all of us are on different journeys and all of those journeys are valid and important. So by talking about success stories today, the intention isn't to diminish or ignore difficult experiences, but we hope that by talking about success, we might be able to encourage and motivate those of you watching who might be having a tough time or those of you thinking about starting a tapering journey. And also, you know, we, we know that success means different things to different people and that healing after taking psychiatric drugs is, a, is it's not a linear or straightforward thing. It, it can be a, a bit of a windy road. Um, so with, with, with that said, I'd like to turn it over to our excellent guest panel for today. Um, Brooke, Michael and Gemma, we're so pleased that you can join us. So um, if it's okay, perhaps um, if each of you could introduce yourselves and perhaps say a little about what made you interested in speaking about psychiatric drug withdrawal. So Brooke, is it okay if we start with you? Sure. All right. This is just my quick intro, right? All right. Yep. So <laughs> my, name, my name is Brooke Seam. Um, I am the author of this book, May Cause Side Effects. Uh, it came out in September. Woo, it's very blurry, but it came out in September of 2022. And this book is very, is, is notable because this is the first book on antidepressant withdrawal that was published by a traditional publisher and marketed toward the mass market. So that's extremely notable because it means that the tide is turning enough on this topic that a publisher was willing to take the risk and put it out into the world and market it through mainstream media channels in order to hopefully get the information out to more people in order to, uh, you know, not have any of us go through it. Um, I went through it myself. I'll talk a little bit more about when we get there, but now my work is all on advocacy around this topic. I speak at universities, corporations, I mean, kind of everywhere because antidepressants and psych drugs are so common that withdrawal therefore is too. That's me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Brooke. And and Gemma? Hi, everyone. I'm Gemma. Um, I went through a um, withdrawal, I think it was about two and a half years ago now. I think it lasted just over a year. I was on metazepine for eight weeks. And I think after the experience that I went through, I think it's really important to spread awareness and also to let people know that you can heal it's not forever it is a horrible process but it's you can get through it and i think that that's really important for people to know yeah great thank you so much and and last but by no means least michael yeah hi everyone i'm michael preby i'm a writer and a wellness coach i actually um do a lot of coaching work with people who are going through the process of getting off these medications and experiencing withdrawal, looking to move through and pass that process and move their lives forward. Um, as far as my continued interest in the topic of withdrawal, I guess primarily it stems from the fact that I experienced it firsthand and severely um, after quitting Paxil and Xanax almost a decade ago by this point. Um, and when I was going through that experience, I made a few promises to myself. One was that when I got through it, I would continue to care for myself in a certain way and live a full life. So I try to do that. Um, two was that I would profess God's healing hand in my journey and share his compassion and grace and love with others. So I try to do that. And lastly, I said, when I get to the other side of this withdrawal tunnel and I see the light, I'm going to share the fact of that light with others. So that's what I try to continue doing. Um, and hopefully by being a part of this panel today, myself and the others sharing our stories, we give others some hope and some evidence that there is light at the end of an experience that can be dark and feel isolated at times. Right. Thank you so much, Michael. That was, that was really lovely. Um, okay. So for the next 30 minutes or so, um, I'd like to ask the panel members now, if you could perhaps share with us your personal withdrawal story and, you know, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about what you were taking, how you approached your withdrawal and how you've been doing since. Uh, and also perhaps if you felt there was something in particular that contributed most to your success in getting off the drugs after your time on them. So, um, Brooke, could we we start again with you? Is that OK? Sure. Uh, feel free to interject, James, if uh, you want me to route myself back onto a particular tangent. Um, but first I wanna say just that I'm watching the chat right now and I started tearing up because not only because of 
just the intensity that I can feel coming through this and so many people who are in the same place, but just also, this is not what I had when I was going through this. You know, I, I was on um, FXRXR and Wellbutrin XL and I had been on them for 15 years. I, my dad had died when I was 15. It was very sudden. And within about six months of his death, I was put on those two drugs. And then that led to polypharmacy with other drugs that weren't psychiatric drugs, because I started to develop physical symptoms. I had a thyroid issue. I had something called bile reflux disease, which in retrospect, were probably pretty clearly a side effect of the antidepressants. But at the time, no one put two and two together. So by the time I was 30, I'd been on the same cocktail of drugs for 15 years. It was between six and eight drugs a day, depending on uh, what was going on. And I was uh, extremely depressed still that had never really gotten better. I was, I was, I would say I was actively suicidal, but not in crisis. It wasn't the kind of thing where I was running around scaring the people around me. It was just something I thought about all the time. And it was so normal. It was like, I look in the mirror and I notice that my hair is brown in the same way I would, you know, think about all the different ways that I could kill myself. Like it just was normal. It was so insidious. And so it didn't really even occur to me that this was a problem because I was so used to it. But then one day I got, it just dawned on me that I shouldn't be this depressed if these antidepressants are working and that these weren't thoughts I should be having if this was working. And uh, I'm going to move quickly through the story, but I had some other reasons to get off these drugs and discovered my baseline. And I went to a psychiatrist, you know, same story, tale as old as time. She didn't know what she was talking about, pulled me off way too quickly. I went off cold turkey of 37.5 milligrams of that Paxar and was just deep into antidepressant withdrawal immediately. My symptoms specifically were, aside from all the, you know, flu-like stuff, the hot, cold shakes and whatnot, I had really violent, intrusive thoughts about hurting myself and other people. That was incredibly terrifying and destabilizing. Um, I had extreme sensory sensitivity, so to light, to noise, fibers on clothes. Um, I developed something called nodular vasculitis, which is an inflammation of the blood vessels. So it looked like I had BB guns or BB pellets all underneath my skin. And then just like incredible rage and mood swings that made me a highly unpleasant person to be around. Uh, Brooke, Brooke can, was, I, can yeah. I ask, when you yeah. first went into withdrawal, did you know that's what it was? Did you know to expect that or was it completely out of the blue for you? It was pretty out of the blue. My psychiatrist had said, you know, you might feel like you have the flu for a couple of days, but it should pass in a, you know, a week or two. Yeah. Kind of the standard line that I think we're kind of still hearing, but she didn't have any concept of hyperbolic tapering for sure. I don't, that word wasn't even invented yet. But she didn't say even open up the capsule, count the beads. She just said, I can't prescribe anything lower because this is all we have. Good luck. Um, and so I had Googled something and I, and I had learned enough through the very limited resources on Google that withdrawal was a thing that people felt weird after they got off these drugs. But what also happened at the same time is um, right as all my senses were kind of going haywire, you know, we're, we're, we're neurologically wired to focus on the negative. So that's a lot of what I remember. But also what happened at the same time is colors literally brightened. Like I remember standing on the streets in New York one day and all of a sudden it was like someone turned up the slider on Instagram. And I said, oh my God, like if these drugs are affecting the way I see color, what else are they affecting? And I got so mad that I said, I am not you know, I'm not taking Prozac to bridge or any of the things they suggested. I said, I'm going to ride this out and figure it out. And I was stubborn and I was angry. And that's what fueled me through. Um, I didn't have any idea how long it was going to last. I still, had I known it lasted about a year for me, had I known it was going to last that long, I don't know if I mentally would have been strong enough, but I still thought I was in it for a few weeks. Um, but then, you know, I started actually working with a, a counselor and this counselor was more of a spiritual counselor. It wasn't a traditional talk therapy because nothing I was experiencing was rational. So what good was rational thought going to do me? We went with a spiritual counselor where we could work with the emotions and the metaphors. And we started to work through all of the trauma that was coming up, not only from my dad's death, but this, what I had experienced in the 15 years I'd been medicated, as well as the 
you know, withdrawal symptoms themselves. And we did it in just this very abstract, almost artistic way that was so wonderful for me to be able to relate to. And it started to really move the energy and I think get, you know, kind of this spiritual and emotional (laughs) gunk out of my system, which in turn helped me get through withdrawal faster because I would have moments of relief. And, you know, if you want to more about that process, I would highly, highly recommend that you, you know, buy and read my book. It's also available on audiobook in case anybody is having trouble reading. I know that's a problem, but I'm not going to spend too much time on that because what I really want to talk about is, you know, the, the after, the hope, the good stuff, the reason why we're all here, right? So I think one of the biggest things that is this difficult hurdle for people to get over and what was really difficult for me to get over is the fact that I had been on these drugs for so long. I had absolutely no frame of reference for who I was supposed to be without them. So, so much of my withdrawal was a question of, am I actually nuts? Am I this angry person? Am I this depressed person? Am I this anxious person? Like, am I just someone who can't function? Because I had no frame of reference. You know, the only unmedicated time I had could compare to was when I was 14 years old and my dad was alive and I was 31 at this point, and he'd been dead for 16 years. So I didn't know what to do. And so for me, I had to come and find some rational acceptance or radical acceptance around the idea that you cannot go back ever. Withdrawal is a one way street. You are going to get spit out on the other side of it, a different person than you were when you started. And that's very scary because we don't know that person. We don't have any connection to that person. I mean, for me, I didn't even like the same foods or the same music. So it was just completely different. But the beauty in that is if you can accept that that that's coming, then you can be open to whatever emerges and you kind of stop fighting, right? You stop fighting this instinct to go back. And when you stop fighting that and you just say, okay, look, I mean, you're going through hell right now, right? I promise you what's on the other side is not going to be that hard in comparison. This is such a great teacher. You will be the most resilient person on the planet. Everything else will start to roll off your back because you're like, it's not withdrawal. I'm good. (laughs) That's a superpower in this world combined with the fact that like you can open yourself to a curiosity about this new person. I mean, I, I, you know, I wrote a book, I'm an artist at heart, but I didn't have any curious instinct on medication. Now, all I want to do is create. I'm learning to oil paint. You know, I write, I, you know, I do modern dance, all of these things where it's just there's a whole new world of exploration out there that is so beyond what you can even conceptualize. So I'm not entirely sure how much more time I have here, but the one thing I would say is that it is so easy in withdrawal to think about all the things you've lost because it's clear, right? We know exactly what we were before. We know what's been taken from us, but it is impossible to conceptualize what you're going to gain on the other side of this because it's a nebulous mystery. And if you can just trust that there's good over there and peace and that, one day you will look back on this and say, it's all worth it. I promise you are going to find that. Um, how much time do I have left? You, you've got, you've got plenty of time, Brooke. I, okay. I, I did want to, I did want to ask you something actually. So you used a phrase, which I instantly connected with a lot, which was radical yeah. acceptance. I absolutely mm-hmm. love, love that. And, yeah. you know, people do talk about accepting where they are, but they see acceptance as somehow, uh, you know, almost giving up or, or yeah. losing control or whatever. Radical acceptance sounds yeah. to me very different. So could, could, could you tell yes. us what that kind of feels like? <laughs> Yeah, sure. I, you know, I can't take um, credit for the phrase. There's a book by Tara Brock called Radical Acceptance. And I've learned a lot from that book. Um, But it's just the idea. It can be, it's the idea of saying yes to everything that comes your way, even the painful brain fog and fatigue as Omar is is accepting or as is saying in the chat, you know, if you shift your mindset to instead of fighting everything that's coming at you, because withdrawal is such so unpredictable, right? I mean, one day you're fine and the next minute you're not. And it's just like, it's maddening because it's so unpredictable. But if you can shift and say, if you're in a wave, if you're in a wave of rage, find just that little break, that little moment and say, yes, and accept the rage as it's coming at you and 
go beat up a pillow or, you know, whatever your method is, but instead of, and, and I mean, really from my perspective, so much of most of us were probably medicated because we were feeling some big feeling that we couldn't articulate and that made other people uncomfortable. Mm. And so therefore we were given a bunch of drugs and sent the message that we needed to push all of this down. And what I think happens in withdrawal is all of that c- comes out all at once because you just, you destroyed the dam that was kind of keeping everything steady. Right. So if you think of it as it's coming up and it feels like it's going to keep coming up and coming up forever, but there is an end to it. It just may be a very, you know, very rushing river because of however many years, but what this process is asking you to do, it's asking you to be the, the student. It is going to be a teacher for you. And to be able to sit with it and let it come in is, 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 is the way out. Um, now, the trick here is to balance that radical acceptance with making withdrawal your identity. Mm-hmm. Because I think many of us, I know I certainly did, I, I spent so much time depressed and anxious that I existed through the lens of a depressed person. I mean, what, ma- what did it matter what job I had if I was going to be miserable no matter what, right? So why go search out something that would make my life possibly better? When I was in that mindset for 15 years and then suddenly I'm in withdrawal, well, the next thing you know is the natural response is I'm in withdrawal. I am someone in withdrawal. So my identity is now in withdrawal. I can't go take a walk or go have lunch with my friends because I'm in withdrawal and I might have a bout of anger or rage and what would happen then? So again, if we if we have the radical acceptance, we accept that this is not who we are, this is something that's happening to us, and then and then really fight against that instinct to be a person in withdrawal forever, which will probably requires you to do a bunch of inner self-work, and that's the hard stuff none of us really want to do. <laughs> but if you do that, it will start to lift as you start to understand the lesson that it's trying to teach you. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Brooke. Um, uh, Gemma, could we could we come to you? I I was really interested to hear that actually metazapine was the drug that you had difficulties with because that's the one that I struggled with too uh, before I, I, I came off. So, um, you know, the floor is yours to kind of tell us a little bit about your experience, if that's okay. Yeah. So, yeah, as, as I said, I was only on them for eight weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, so my time frame isn't like everybody else's I was on them for eight weeks and um I I went on them because I was having panic attacks due to the pandemic yeah. um obviously I know a lot of people were anxious there was obviously something there before brewing that obviously was activated once everything happened um I wouldn't say like I struggled with depression or anything but I I did struggle a lot with anxiety in the past um a slight bit of health anxiety, I think, was there underlining. Um, and, yeah, I was put on metazepine. Um, originally, it was 30 milligrams, but I quickly realised that that just knocked me out. So, luckily, I halved it I, after taking it for about a day or two. Um, so, yeah, I was on that for eight weeks, and then I started to feel better, so I thought, Okay, no, I never wanted to take antidepressants, uh, antidepressants. And I didn't know anything about antidepressants. I didn't know how to come off of them or anything like that. So I did hear that you probably should wean yourself off of them. So I took it upon myself for the first few days to, um, well, I think I, I, I didn't half the tablet. I think I, I took it every other day. And then I consulted my doctor and she said, oh, that's fine. Just do that for a week. And then you can just stop taking them because you haven't been on them for too long. So I did that. And then after that week was up, um, the, the, my symptoms were getting worse. That's when I started to Google. And then the, the, the first thing that I saw was that um, I think it was serotonin sy- syndrome, something along them lines. And it said that it only lasts for four weeks. So I thought, OK, so if I can just get through the first four weeks, then it will be fine. Over the four weeks, it got progressively worse. I was calling the doctors. Um, the, the main thing that they were concerned about was, was I suicidal at that point? No, I wasn't. But I kept on explaining this doesn't feel normal. And they kept on advising me, or oh, maybe you should go back on it. Maybe you're relapsing. I said, no, like I've, I was only on them for eight weeks. So I know my body. This isn't normal. Um, 
and yeah, it just got progressively worse over the the course of weeks that it was happening. Um, I went through so many different symptoms. Every day was different. I I didn't sleep. I was scared to go outside. I was scared to drive. I had nerve pains. I had breathing issues. Um, and it was and it was so difficult because the the doctors just. I mean, at one point I was going to the doctors every day and they didn't even know what to do with me. They were just staring at me because they they said that they'd never seen this before. So, um, and it feels, you, you feel like you're so alone at that point because where is there to turn to? So I did a, a lot of Googling and luckily I came across Michael's video, which gave me so much hope. The first thing I saw was um, don't let the horror stories scare you. And after seeing that, it was like, I thought, Obviously, at that point, I had no idea how long that this this was going to go on, but I had hoped that this wasn't going to go on forever. Mm. Um, yeah, and just over the course of that year and in that space of time, I also had two major surgeries. I had my thyroid removed and another emergency surgery at the time, so that didn't help. Um, and just a whole host of other things going on. Then the UTI, if anyone's seen my... YouTube videos then you'll know the, the UTI saga that went on for months and I had so many different antibiotics which exasperated all of my symptoms which was just even worse yeah. but um yeah then I think that I'm not sure when I noticed it started easy easing up I mean it was even when it did start even when I felt like okay maybe it's getting better it, it, it still wasn't like it would be like a day and then like it would carry on again for another couple of weeks and yeah I think I got it was after I had my thyroid removed and then a few months after that it, even even that was was still awful because it the health anxiety really revved up then and then like I was backwards and forwards to A&E constantly calling the doctors I'm sure they just thought I was absolutely crazy at that point <laughs> Um, but yeah, after that, then it did start to get better. And then, but then I realized that obviously there was a reason why I went on them. And although the pandemic did ignite things, there was something there that I needed to address. I did have, um, therapy, CBT therapy while I was in withdrawal, but I'm sure most of us know at that point, your, your feelings and everything that you're going through aren't really real like the the anxiety was like chemically induced it, 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 I was just getting anxious I could watch a movie and I was having a panic attack so that didn't really help it was just an outlet at that point so after that I then found a therapist I chose her very carefully I told her exactly what I wanted I didn't want to manage anything I wanted to get rid of everything because I truly believe that you can and she said yep she believed me because that was also um, another issue that I don't know most people probably find that a lot of people don't believe you I got questioned a lot oh, are you sure it's not this are you sure it's not that but um, luckily she believed me and she listened to me and I've been with her for two and a half years now and I think I've made so much progress even from before like I'm not saying withdrawal is, is one of those things that for me I wouldn't look back and say, oh, I'll do it all over again to get to this point. There are situations that I've been through. I can say, yes, I can handle that because that was absolute hell. But I am grateful to be where I am now because I definitely feel a whole lot better than I did before I took antidepressants just in who I am, how I manage things, my relationships with people. I just... I like myself more. I love myself more and I can push myself to do things that I didn't think that I could. I'm just in a much better place overall. Yeah. Gemma, that's, so, that's, that's fantastic to hear. I'm so, so sorry you went through that experience, but you know, I, I, I can't help but think about how, you know, how affirming it is to find somebody that, that, takes you seriously and doesn't just brush the issue off and you know I know you said you went so many times to the doctors and I'm sure so many of us here have just been told by doctors this doesn't happen it's not possible it must be something else you know I've never seen this before all those kind of things so you know I, I, I wondered if you could describe to us maybe a little bit of you know how it felt to find a therapist that you could actually work with who was willing to believe you and willing to go on that journey with you. Uh, it was it was such a relief because 
as I said, even even though I had CBT therapy and I had um, other counselling sessions, I mean, they they offer you six sessions. I'm not sure what they think they can cure in six hours, but yeah, it didn't. It wasn't majorly helpful, but it was it was such a relief because she was willing to listen to me and she didn't make me feel like she was pretending to believe what I was going through. She actually said that I have seen this before and I understand. And you know, s- slowly but surely, just having. I think that did just help a lot knowing that this person believed me. So it was, yeah, it was, it was good. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and, you know, so how, you know, how, how, you know, how do you feel now, I guess, compared to before you went on the antidepressants? And again, you know, we, we, so many of us have been in that place where we kind of get to a point where we feel so stuck. We think, well, we'll, we'll try the drugs because, you know, there don't seem to be any other routes and, you know, we're a bit desperate. So, you know, how, how do you feel now? You know, I recall, you know, Brooke saying that, you know, you could see this as being, you know, you being a better person because of the experience that you've been through and, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, how, how are things for you now compared to those difficult times in the pandemic? Um, I believe everything happens for a reason and I think that I was given that battle for a reason because Mm. I do feel like after all of the work that I've done on myself and all the books that I've read and like really faced some issues that like I think that we don't realize that we avoid we have so many different distractions even when you think like oh I'm, I'm not doing that I'm not doing this I'm not doing that you will still find other ways to distract yourself from feeling things that you don't want to feel and I think that I faced a lot of fears that um, I was avoiding. And so just that in itself has just made me feel so much more like a a warrior. And having gone through that, it's given me, it's given me the confidence to push me to do a lot of things that I didn't ever think that I'd be able to do. So I just, I'm in a much better place now. Fantastic. Fantastic. I'm so pleased to hear that. And, you know, thanks for all you've done with your videos and, you know, educating others and sharing your experiences. You know, I think it's so, so brave to go through those experiences and then use the benefit to help others. And, you know, I know all three of you have have done a huge amount of that. So thank you so much, Gemma. And um, Michael, if it's okay, could we we come to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, I think a good place to begin talking about what I went through is with the circumstances that directly preceded getting on medications. And those were panic attacks that I was experiencing uh, way back in 1999 when I was heading into my senior year of school at uh, UW-Madison Journalism School. And I didn't know what I was experiencing. Um, I just knew it was scary. And it was depleting. Um, If anyone's ever had the attacks, as obviously some of us have, um, you know how it just drains you, um, scrambles your brain and drains you emotionally. And so I started worrying about the attacks in between the attacks and descended into kind of a state of perpetual anxiety. And it became clear after a while that something had to change. And my idea was, OK, I'm going to drop out of school, um, take some time off, figure things out. You know, I didn't know it wasn't a, a great idea, but it was an idea. And after talking to my parents, they said, why don't you go see the family doctor? Um, You know, just just tell what you're going through, see what he says. So I did. I was home for a few weeks before fall semester that year. And I went to a man I saw once, by the way, in my life. Uh, It wasn't even my doctor. It was like my parents' doctor. And via means of a a brief visit, a brief questionnaire, I was given two disorder labels, um, panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, And then given two medications, Paxil and SSRI, um, which was all the rage at that time, (laughs) or it's just beginning to come into its own, and Xanax, uh, uh, benzodiazepine. And I wasn't thrilled about the idea of taking these medications, um, especially something like an SSRI that you had to ingest every day. And even according to the doctors, it takes some time to snake its way into your system. And you wonder, okay, what does that even mean? Um, you know, but I, I convinced myself, I said, okay, I'm not going to overthink this. I'm not going to perpetually question it. I'm going to take it dutifully and get on with the rest of the school year. And I did, um, even though, especially with the SSRI, there was signs if I'd been looking that things were off right away, as far as increased fatigue, just the lack of attention to 
little things like keeping my apartment clean that I used to care about and so forth. Um, but anyway, I got through that year, got all A's that year. So I was a success from that standpoint, graduated on time and then got on with my life. Um, uh, met my wife who I'm still married to, uh, started a career actually in education, uh, working with like ESL students cause I'm bilingual working with, uh, special education populations. And I moved on with my life and it was a good life. My life is a good life. I don't look at those years on the medications as throwaway by any means, but there was always certain effects of the medications, ill effects. They were always just below the surface. And at times they would poke through in very obvious ways, but they were always there below the surface. And I think so was my desire to get off the medication because I had never really wanted to be on them in the first place. Um, so by the time I got to my mid thirties, you know, things kind of came to a crossroads for me. Those effects that had been there began poking through in more and more obvious and harmful ways. Um, I had put on a lot of weight. I was having problems keeping myself in shape. I was fatigued a lot of the time. The anxiety had just gotten worse and worse and worse. Um, the Xanax prescription that had started at 0.25 milligrams as needed ballooned to four milligrams per day. Um, and that was just the prescription. I was oftentimes taking more, running out early. I was completely dependent on the medication, um, physically and psychologically, riding that roller coaster of inner dose withdrawals, um, certainly intolerance. And, you know, who knows what sort of tolerance to the SSRI at the time as well. So by the time I got to my mid thirties, I said, okay, something's got to change. And I want my life to change in a lot of ways for the better. You know, I want to feel closer to God. I want to be more creative. I want to feel closer to my wife. I want to try new things professionally because I wasn't all that fulfilled at my job anymore. Even though it was a great job, great people, great benefits, the whole nine yards. I just felt that I wanted to make changes in my life. And kind of the linchpin in that whole deal was getting off the medications. That was what it depended upon. So I was very determined, wasn't all that educated, but I was supremely determined. I got off the pack. So rather quickly <laughs> to put it mildly, it was almost a cold Turkey. Um, the best of my recollection, just kind of cut it in half and then stopped taking it, which, you know, obviously not a recommendation. I'm not the poster boy for a great taper method personally. Um, but my, I Michael, a, Michael, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Did, did you anticipate problems when you did that or did you just think to hell with it? I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I anticipated maybe like a week of problems yeah. <laughs> or a couple of weeks of problems. You know, like if you've seen the movie Train Spotting, you watch someone get off heroin. I'm like, OK, maybe I'm going to shiver in a corner with tomato soup for a week in my bed and then it's over. Um, so I anticipated something, but nothing like what actually happened. Um, and what actually happened, you know, was obviously the, the flu-like stuff, severe insomnia, severe um, terror, night sweats, um, and really the, the hardest part of that, that first year off Paxil for me was the depression, mm -hmm. just the deep soul-sucking depression, the anhedonia. Um, those were probably among the biggest challenges that year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and I had made it several months off the medication or off the Paxil. I was tapering my Xanax at the same time. So I made it several months off the Paxil and I was, you know, again, supremely committed to it. And I was proud of myself, but I remember one day I was home alone. It was like a Saturday and people were out doing their own thing. My wife was out and I was uh, home alone. And I, I just said, I can't take this anymore. So I broke down and tried to reinstate like with a single dose of the Paxil. Yep. And it made me even sicker than before, which is saying a lot. And so now not only, you know, did I feel like, okay, this withdrawal thing maybe is never going to end for me. Maybe this isn't how my path is meant to be without the medications. I felt, well, the medications don't even work. Mm -hmm. um, and I also felt like a failure because this had been a goal of mine. So I can remember like breaking down, you know, I'm a 30 some year old man calling my mom, breaking down in the middle of the day saying, you know, listen, I took this single dose. I know I said I was getting off these. Please don't, you know, judge me or feel 
you know, in some way that I didn't follow through on this goal. And of course they reassured me, listen, you know, we're going to love you no matter if you're on meds or off meds or whatever. But um, around that same time, I, I tried small dose of Welbutrin for like 10 days, just made me very anxious. Tried a small dose of Lexapro for like two months, didn't do anything. And then uh, finally I said, okay, listen, my path forward doesn't involve taking any additional medications. Yeah. My, Path forward involves simplifying the picture, getting the medications out of the picture. And that, that that seems like quite an important realization in your story, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it really was. And I think a lot of people go through um, that confused kind of waffling period of, you know, toying with reinstatement. Can I really, am I really someone who can survive without these or do I need them? You know, am I like a person who needs glasses or the diabetic who needs insulin? You know, it's some of that sort of uh, mental confusion about your identity. But I said, okay, my path forward no longer involves that. I continued with my Xanax taper, um, finished that about a year, year and a quarter after getting off the Paxil. So early 2014, I jumped off the Xanax. And I can remember it was maybe a little bit sooner than I had planned to jump off initially, but my grandmother had passed away. And so that gave me kind of two reasons to get off at that point. One was practical. I said, okay, I've got some bereavement leave I can use from work. So if I take that last dose and things fall apart worse than they have been, I'll be at least in my apartment and not at the office. Cause so I was mm -hmm. still working at the time, even though I found ways to have, uh, you know, sick leave, creative use of that, creative use of vacation time and so forth to have some early leave days, reduce stress. But anyway, I said, okay, I'll have some bereavement leave. So I'll be at home for a few days, you know, and at the funeral. <laughs> um, but also it was more of a spiritual thing too. It was like, okay, it really hammered home for me. None of us have forever on this planet. So, you know, it's like they say in Shawshank Redemption, get busy living or get busy dying. And that's what I was thinking of. Um, and I wanted to get busy living because for me, and, you know, if you talk to people who knew me, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that the path of meds felt like the other the path of dying for me. Um, you know, I was on three different blood pressure medications as well at this point because my health had gotten out of control. So I got off the Paxil, got off the Xanax and, um, you know, I had a lot of symptoms with the Xanax as well. Obviously a lot of strange head pressure, uh, the brain moving around in the head sort of thing, a lot of nerve pain, which I actually went to the doctor for and, um, they didn't give me a lot of great reassurance or insight um, when I went to the doctors, by the way, but that's a common occurrence, I think. So when I did get off the Xanax, I used to have a little spreadsheet where I kept track of like my symptoms and the dosage towards the end of my uh, benzo taper. And then that turned into, instead of listing the dosage, it turned into day one, no meds, and then day two, no meds. Um, you know, so I, I just want to, for people out there watching, I can't overstate um, how impossible I thought it was, it was at one point to even survive a day without meds. Um, you know, maybe that's where you're at. I can't overstate how impossible it was at one point, um, how impossible I thought it was to survive withdrawal. I mean, the things you're experiencing, we've been there. Um, but like Brooke talked about, there, there's a lot of stubborn determination there and I was determined so despite the symptoms I was having I said okay I'm going to keep battling through this and I'm going to make other healthy changes in my life I'm going to start eating healthier you know just like cooking for myself more fruits and vegetables uh not going out to eat not eating grease and processed stuff all the time little things uh, I'm going to take exercise seriously uh, I'm going to start each day with God time, you know, devotion, prayer, journaling. Um, you know, these are some of the things that helped me. I didn't really work with you know, a therapist. Um, I, I didn't work with a psychiatrist, but I said, okay, what are the things that any quote unquote normal human being needs to feel well and have a happy, good life. And I'm going to do these things for myself and do them consistently. Um, so again, time with God, exercise, good nutrition, uh, but also, you know, support from people that believed in me. Mm. Uh, you know, it was so dejecting and disheartening 
when I went to doctors and I only went like three times, but, but each time it was, you know, more of the same. Any PAX withdrawal should have been over a long time ago. It should have been mild. Um, benzo withdrawal, even though you're in the middle of tapering this four daily milligrams, that's not the source of your nerve pain. It's stress. <laughs> um, not to downplay the effects of stress, certainly. Uh, but again, it was just like a, a lack of understanding and you really felt like you're on your own in many respects. So the support of people who believed in what I was doing and took me at my word, even though they couldn't fully understand what I was going through, meant the world. Um, you know, and people like my family members were always careful to point out ways I was improving, even if I couldn't see them myself all the time or see them myself all the time. Um, you know, you look like you have more color in your face. You look like you are enjoying yourself the other day. You look like you have more energy. Um, you know, just keep at it. You know, they didn't overreact to my symptoms and say, listen, uh, the way you're acting, the way you're thinking, you got to get back on this stuff. No, they said, stick with it. You were on these pills for quite a while. There's yeah. going to be a period of adjustment here. You are getting better and it will get better. So, um, again, we're here today to provide a message of, of hope. And, uh, you know, I just think back to when I was on between 20 and 40 milligrams of Paxil taken, you know, four to eight milligrams of Xanax a day on three different blood pressure medications, which I subsequently weaned myself off of um, and feeling really depressed, fatigued. And I felt under the thumb of these medications. So when I was able to get them out of my life, Although I had to endure a difficult withdrawal, I, I never, ever regret that decision. Like the other panelists alluded to, uh, the withdrawal kind of forces growth on you, <laughs> even if you wouldn't choose it that way. Um, and it kind of puts into place, I think, the pillars of a healthy lifestyle. The things you had to do to survive withdrawal back then, you do now to feel well. And that's kind of how I live. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I hope that sharing my story provide some hope because, you know, we talked about this yesterday, people out there watching might be at that place where it feels like rock bottom. Yeah. I was there too. Um, things do not have to stay that way and they won't stay that way. If you keep moving forward through the process and, and, you know, become an active participant in your healing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Michael. You know, I, I um, while listening to you, you know, you, you made me realize the importance of celebrating small victories you know, the tiniest, tiniest victory, you know, may, maybe you got out of bed a little bit earlier or may, maybe you got dressed and walked around the block or, you know, what, whatever it was, the tiniest thing we need to celebrate and shout from the rooftops because they are the things that when added up actually make a big difference in our lives, aren't they? Yeah, a, a thousand percent. Um, you really have to accentuate, set little goals for yourself as you're going through a draw and really be proud every time you check one of those goals off a list. Um, the big goal is obviously to endure and get past it, but you got to pass all that time and cope in a certain way. So you set little goals and you celebrate each and every one. And for some people, it is as simple as, okay, I showered today. <laughs> it's a big thing some days. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, we've got a few minutes left before we move on. So I, I just wondered, you know, if if any of the three of you had reflections on each other's experiences, because I'm sure you recognize much of what happened to you in others' experiences, but there will be differences too. So, you know, the floor's kind of open if you had reflections on, you know, what, on each other's kind of um, what, you know, what each other went through. I, I think the thing that I noticed the most, at least kind of the overarching theme is that there was a point where we all made a choice to heal. And I, I don't think that that can be overstated because especially given that the reason why we're all here is because we spent a long time listening to other people tell us what's best about our health. And there comes a moment where you have to say, I've got to, like, you just have to be able to find that strength within yourself and make the choice to heal. And I don't know how to explain how you do it. It's just something that happens. and then every interaction you start having with everybody else in your life is going to change. And that, I think that's what starts the whole healing process. Mm. Yeah. I think that um, for me, like the other two panelists said, like, I just knew that there was something inside of me that just wouldn't let me give up. 
And I would always say to myself, just one more day, just one more day. Like my mum used to call me every day and she would just say, just take one day at a time. Mm-hmm. And But that's all you could do at, at that point. And but I just knew that like this, I, I can't give up. Like I just can't give up. And like I just knew that I had to get to the other side. I didn't know how long it was going to take, but I just had to. Yeah, I mean, the importance of, of determination can't be overstated. It really is a, a it's a triumph of the human spirit in some respects when you get through this and past this. Um, and if you make it more important than anything else in the world, including just the avoidance of pain, <laughs> if you make it your goal to get through this and get past it, you will. Um, and it sure helps if you have people cheering you on, um, yeah. w- whether it's family or a counselor or a pastor or a therapist or a coach or whoever. Um, but deep within yourself, there's got to be that determination as well. So, um, you know, find it and nurture it. Yeah. We all had people too, which, which is interesting. I know that like Gemma, my, when I had moments where I didn't think I could do it, I called my mom and she just said to me, you're not crazy. I know that kid. I knew you before you were born. Like, I know what you were like when you were a kid and that this isn't, this isn't you. And I needed that. So, you know, I really feel for people who don't have that, but I do think it's really important to have kind of that unconditional outside support there. And if you don't have it, maybe find a way to pay for it. I know that sounds extreme, but you got to have someone reminding you of yeah. why you're doing it and that you're okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, the three of you shared such powerful stories and, you know, I, I know that, you know, there will be so much in what you said that resonated with everyone listening, you know, to, to me, you know, I couldn't help but pick up on certain phrases like radical acceptance. Gemma, mm-hmm. you said you felt like a warrior, you know, Michael, you talked about the importance of celebrating the, the small things, you know, and, there are answers in your stories for people that will help them. And, you know, so I, I, you know, I hope that people got as much out of listening to that as I did, because I, I got a huge amount from it. Thank you. Um, we're, we're kind of coming up to the question and answer part and Karina has been um, busily pulling the questions out for us. So um, uh, Karina said earlier, if you have a question, please do use the Q&A box so we, we can see it. And I do need to mention again that, you know, the panel can't give medical advice or give specific instructions to a, an individual because experiences are so very different and, and so complicated. Um, but thank you so much to all of you that have been sending in questions so far. I, I know from previous events that we won't be able to get to answer all of the questions in the time that we have, but we will try and get through as many as we have in, in, in the time that we have. And um, for the panel members, please feel free to jump in and respond to these um, a, a, as you wish to. So um, the first question is, um, is there a circumstance where healing is not possible? Does the age you are put on medications make a difference in coming off or healing? Well, I'll take a stab at that one. Um... I mean, we, you know, I, I don't think any of us can say for sure, you know, anything about this. I mean, there's, there's, unfortunately we're in the infancy of research here, as far as the age you were put on. I mean, I was put on at 15. Um, I hear, I know stories of plenty of people who are put on as children and who have successfully gotten off. Um, there does seem to be some research that shows that the longer you're on these drugs, the more difficult it can be to get off. And just, I think really, if anything, you just need to give yourself a lot more time Um, from my perspective, you know, I was on these drugs for 15 years. I couldn't expect to be whatever my new normal was going to be in six weeks. It just wasn't going to happen that quickly. So a little grace and patience there for your own body, I think is helpful. Um, but as far as healing not being possible, and this kind of, uh, echoes back to some other questions where people were asking, you know, I've been in withdrawal for four or five years or whatnot, and I'm having all of these symptoms, you know, what do we do? And there's, there's a sort of desperation and hopelessness in the energy of those questions. And to that, I would just like to say that I think that there's a point at which maybe let's abandon the idea of withdrawal and let's just deal with whatever's there. Who cares? If your your depression, your anxiety, your the psychosis, the acusthesia, whatever, who cares if it's withdrawal or not? If you can figure out a way, especially if you've been in it for a while, to just deal with whatever's been happening that day 
and and release all of the expectations or the assumptions or the anger around why it happened, I found that that was a huge help in actually moving through the symptoms because you do get to a point where you're just like, I don't know if this is withdrawal, is this me, is this is this the food I ate yesterday? Like you have no idea, right? So it's like a like a like a ball, ball of wool, isn't it? There's lots of ends, and you don't know which one to yeah. pull. It all gets raveled together. Exactly. So if you just forget that and say, well, today I am nauseous. So what do we do for that? Right. And if you, you know, again, if you have a counselor or therapist of some kind, that's very helpful to take that framework into your work as well. But to me, that just took all the pressure off because suddenly it wasn't this big, scary thing anymore. It was just that today I'm nauseous or today I'm angry and you just deal with it. Yeah. And I think that kind of speaks to Brooke, what you said earlier, um, there's a real danger in withdrawal becoming a piece of your identity mm -hmm. after a while. Um, and therefore, it kind of limits beliefs about what, what you mm -hmm. can do, what you can't do, what's possible in the future. Well, I, you know, maybe other people can, but I can't because I'm going through withdrawal. And trust me, I was there too. Um, I don't say these things because I, I didn't experience them. I can remember <clears throat> specifically, you know, when I was getting along in my healing. But still, my mind is wrapped up in withdrawal so much of the time. And I remember talking to one of my brothers who had been a great support for me throughout. He was basically like my therapist. I could put it that way. Um, but I, I was talking to him and I, I brought up withdrawal again. And, you know, this had been going on for a while. And he said, listen, everything you're experiencing right now isn't withdrawal anymore. Um, and I said, well, you know, I was angry. I was really angry. And I said, how do you know? He said, I know it because I experienced some of these same things, too these emotional things and these mental things and these different challenges you describe, you know, so let's just find a way to, like you said, keep, keep moving on. Um, you know, okay, what can I do to calm my mind? What can I do to put my head in a good spot? What can I do to put my emotions in a good spot? And again, it, at the end of the day, after a while, it doesn't matter how you label the source of it. If you care for yourself in a certain way, it's going to fix withdrawal and it's going to fix whatever else is there too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so to move on to the second question. So um, someone's asking, how much do you think having low levels of vitamins and minerals can make, make withdrawal more difficult? So this person had low vitamin B12 and vitamin D. Are there any supplements, special infusions, saunas, et cetera, that have helped you? Um, so, oh, go ahead, John. Um, for, for me, I was a bit concerned about taking um, supplements while going through withdrawal because I, I suffer with hay fever. I was even worried about taking antihistamines. But um, I think things like going to the sauna and those sort of things, I, I would definitely try. I didn't try that. I used to do things like grounding. I'd go out in my garden with, with no shoes on for 20 minutes or go for a walk or a cold shower or just certain little things. But I, I can't give any advice on vitamins, but I would be careful like i slowly try things just to see yeah i mean i was never someone who took a lot of supplements um i still don't take a ton i mean occasionally i'll take uh you know some workout supplements nowadays um vitamin d during certain times of the year because uh, i'm from wisconsin i live there most of the year um i've been spending the last few months in florida and tennessee but um, I, I guess that's one thing I would say, like Gemma said, try slowly um, to see if you can tolerate something. But um, the one that I found to be most important over the years, and not even necessarily during withdrawal healing, but was just vitamin D, because I, I came to realize that after I got off the pills, I was someone who was extremely affected by uh, winter, you know, seasonal affective disorder, whatever you want to call it, living in Wisconsin. And I could see my mood getting low, my energy getting low, my sleep getting disrupted. And so over the years, that is something I became aware of and began supplementing with vitamin D or going someplace with more sunshine during those months to feel well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I have spent, I mean, t probably 10, $20,000, so much money um, on, on deep, deep medical testing because for a variety of reasons, but a big part of it is deep curiosity. Um, and what I have learned from that process, when especially the answer to the supplement question is personally, 
I, I'm inclined to believe that any supplement is a total and complete waste of time unless you've had really in-depth blood work in order to understand what your body is and what your body looks like. Because the bottom line is like, you know what, at, at, at worst, you're just throwing away some money. Or I mean, at best, you're throwing away some money. Or worst, you're throwing away some money. So you could try some things if you want. But it's so much more important to know what your blood, what's going on in your blood and your whole body in my opinion, because then that's when supplementation might actually be helpful. So um, I've documented some of what I've done on TikTok. Um, I'm going to toss one of them into the chat here. But but like, if if you have the availability or if you're in a country where healthcare isn't as stupid as it, as it is in the US, you might be able to request a really in-depth blood panel, like far beyond just the five or six things they usually test annually in order to really see what your levels are and, you know, your hormone levels and your, you know, your, your gut health, what that looks like. Like my gut was so screwed up after antidepressants. I had Giardia, a staph infection and a strep infection in my gut because it was just wrecked. So I've been trying to fix that, which is why I've gone down this absurd rabbit hole. But what I've learned from that is the whole system is so connected that you can you can toss, you know, some random vegetable or whatever added and it might help. But unless you're really working with a specialist who really knows what they're doing. I personally don't recommend it simply because you don't. I don't know, kind of why make things worth, worse when they're unlikely to be made better unless you really know what's going on in your body. But if you find I would look for integrative health specialists. Um, uh, and, you know, nutritionists who can run your blood work. Great. Thank you all. You know, I, I, you know, I, I too have heard mixed things about supplements, but I have heard very good things about people that have made small adjustments to their diet to try and include more fresh food. Now, you know, that, that is an easy thing to say and a difficult thing to do. Sometimes when you're in the depths of this, even the thought of cooking, if you're, you know, feeling nauseous or whatever else might struggle. But, uh, you know, I think um, trying to improve your diet, even a tiny bit can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. And I think, Gemma, you mentioned it, self-care is so important in these times. All of us give ourselves the biggest kicking when we're having a, 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 a when we're having a wave or when we're struggling with something. And, you know, your body's trying to do its best to heal and we pile stress and angst on top of that by giving ourselves a good kicking but self-care is so important isn't it so maybe you know eating a bit more fresh food or getting a bit just a tiny bit of fresh air or whatever it might be so you know Gemma thank you for mentioning that yeah I definitely think that you need to be patient and compassionate with yourself and yeah don't overwhelm yourself too much but yeah all those things are definitely good Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, the third question we've got, and these are great questions. Thank you all for, for contributing them. Um, when you hear people suffering one, two years or more, that is a long time. But what about those of us still tapering and suffering many years in? Does that mean it won't happen for us? Um, I can jump in there, I guess. Um, no, it doesn't. Absolutely doesn't. Um, you know, we, we talk about our stories. And although mine was protracted, certainly, um, and, and took a few years for me to really get back to a sense of normalcy, A, it doesn't mean that someone else is going to have that same length or severity of experience because there's a lot of personal variables that come into what I went through. Mm -hmm. But it also doesn't mean that if you're going through something for a greater amount of time than myself or one of the other panelists has gone through, that something's going haywire or wrong. Um, you know, and uh, tapering people, have their own individual ways they go about it. You know, gr gradual can be good. Um, it's recommended, it's certainly better than what a lot of doctors recommend. Um, but if you're still tapering after a long time, then you're still in, in the middle of a process, you know, so you're going to have to be encouraging and patient with yourself. And there, there's nothing, I often say this to people, so unique in your situation or broken in your situation that these same healing measures that happen for us won't happen for you. Um, I guess that's, those are my initial thoughts on that. Thank you. I'd also like to give a shout out to Angie Peacock, who I believe I saw her pop up in the chat. She, she was featured in the documentary Medicating Normal. And I don't, she and I haven't ever talked personally, but Angie, I, I'm in such awe of you. And I know that she talks about her story, which was, a longer with or a longer recovery process than you know me at least and so she is like 
in my opinion, she's a little light out there for people who've been in this for a really, really long time. And so I recommend uh, going and following her on Instagram and maybe working with her if you can. So that's Angie, Angie Peacock, Medicating Normal Documentary. Okay, thank you. So um, we'll move on. And next one, um, when you are tapering very, very slowly, but still struggling, how do you keep hope to keep going, especially knowing that people say the lower you go, the harder it gets? You don't have to believe them. Start with that. <laughs> um, you know, you we don't know. No one knows. Yeah. And the placebo effect is very strong here, as is the no nocebo effect. So the work of Irving Kirsch talks a lot about placebo. Um, and the bottom line is, if you think it's going to get worse, it probably will. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, it might not. But it might get worse, but you're probably going to be a little mentally better equipped to handle it. So... Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it, Brooke? You know, we 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 can absolutely influence ourselves that things are going to be awful. Mm -hmm. But if we can do that, then it means on the flip side, if we do try yep. and think more positively about the experience and try to welcome it, try to accept it, radical acceptance, then, you know, sometimes it doesn't hit as hard as we, you know, we might think. Mm hmm Yeah, I mean, I would, I would agree. Um, and it's not to you know, be naive about things, but you can certainly talk yourself into experiencing some pain that maybe otherwise wouldn't be there. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not like a poster boy for doing everything quote unquote correctly, but I am proof that you can do a lot of things in a manner that might not be textbook and still come out on the other side feeling better. Um, you know, so anticipate good things. If something comes up and it's difficult, okay, be equipped to deal with it. Have your support systems and your self care practices, um, but you know don't expect them to be bad. Be equipped, but don't expect. And you can slow down too. There's nothing. No one's saying that if you're not if you're if you're having a rough time at you know nine milligrams, hang out there for a while. Like yeah. you know, don't rush yeah, forever. I, yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I know many people who you know, we're doing fine with their tapering journey. And then, you know, something quite traumatic happened in their lives. Maybe mm -hmm. they, you know, lost a relative or, you know, got fired or whatever else it might be. And, you know, they had to pause their taper at that time because there was so much other shit going on in their lives at that time. And there is absolutely no guilt and no shame and no embarrassment whatsoever in giving yourself a break. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. So, um, there, there is a question that um, does go into some specifics, but there is quite an important point there in terms of one of the things that many, many people struggle with when they go on these drugs or perhaps when they try and come off and many of the classes of drugs do this is they put on a lot, on a lot of weight and they start to suffer metabolic problems. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I don't know whether, you know, I think, Michael, you mentioned a, a little bit about this, you know, are, are the things that you did to, you know, in your journey off to try and do something about that? You know, was weight gain a problem for any of you? And if so, how, how did you deal with that? Yeah, well, I, I can speak to that, I guess. I mean, on the medications? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, it was a, not to throw a pun in there, but it was a huge problem for me. <laughs> it was, um, and I was someone who, I was someone who always grew up as an athlete, specifically basketball. It was, you know, I lived and breathed it all through grade school, high school, I was quite good at it. Um, you know, and then I got on these medications and I would have years where I would exercise and then years where things just went south. And I had, you know, ballooned up to 70, 80 pounds overweight, no joke. And again, I'd been put on three different blood pressure medications, including hundred milligrams of metaprolol beta blocker, which some people take for like performance anxiety. And this was not a small dose. Um, yeah. So what I, what I did for that was I did change my diet, um, which used to be crap, honestly, uh, a lot of the years in my twenties, early thirties. So, you know, began um, eating more fruits, vegetables, cooking for myself, lean meats, um, and making exercise a priority. Physical movement, I believe is just so important. Um, not just to even maintain a healthy weight, 
but from a mental and emotional health standpoint, exercise is so supremely important. And I believe it's like a great gift from God. It's free, it's accessible. Um, and anytime you have additional stress that gets thrown into your life, you can throw in additional exercise at no additional cost. And it helps you get through those periods. But to the weight gain, um, yeah, I made diet changes for a while. I restricted calories. Um, but mostly it was just getting serious about um, exercise, which at the beginning was just walking. Mm. Right. And then that morphed into running and lifting and so forth. But at the beginning, it was just walking. So meet yourself where you're at with, with that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think it was the, the, the same for me as well. Um, I it, When I was actually on the antidepressant, um, <clears throat> if my eyes were open, I was eating. And within eight weeks, I'm sure I gained like a stone. But um, coming off of it, obviously there were, there were periods of time where I just couldn't eat. But like Michael, I just started walking and just doing what I could. I couldn't, I, I couldn't really go to the gym at that point, but when I was able to, I was eating better and walking as much as I could. And then, yeah, I, did, I was able to lose the weight. Now it's a bit different to have my thyroid removed, but yeah, that's a whole different story. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you all. Yeah, it's it's important to know, isn't it, that you know it do, doesn't have to be high impact going to the gym, weightlifting. You know, I mean, start off really, really simply, and if you can't do it one day, don't give yourself a hard time. Leave it, and then try and do it the day after. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, the next one is: How do you distinguish withdrawal from mental illness that does benefit from medication? Oh, I, James, I feel like you might be the one to answer that. <laughs> well, uh, this is uh, it's so it's so difficult, isn't it? Because, you know, th- this is very subjective. You know, we, we you know, I, I think, you know, people do find benefit in the drugs. You know, not everybody gets withdrawal symptoms when they try to come off. But, you know, understanding whether you need particular help or not, is a very personal thing. And, you know, some people do manage to stay on the drugs and live their lives quite happily um, and never really come across that difficulty of withdrawal. So, you know, it's it's a difficult question to answer on behalf of a population. I think we can only answer as individuals. You know, I, for my particular journey, you know, I, I did believe that I was mentally very ill and needed the drugs and couldn't really function without them. And I know some of you said that, you know, I thought I was a damaged, broken, worthless person that, uh, you know, my only, you know, the only way I could live my life was to sit at home and and take these drugs and deal with the side effects. And that was, I was broken and on a scrap heap and that was it. But, you know, once I found a community of people that understood, were sympathetic to, no, you don't need the drugs to be an authentic person then gradually over time I came to find the strength to withdraw myself it took a long time took me two and a half years to get off and now looking back I know that I didn't need the drugs to be an authentic person and you know they weren't filling in any gap in my personality or they weren't fixing any chemical imbalance in my brain but you know that's for me I can't say that for anybody else um you know I, I I think um you know, we, we do all think differently about mental illness and, you know, whether these are problems in the brain or, or problems of environment and society and poverty and, mm-hmm. you know, discrimination and all these kind of things. So I, I think the best thing is to believe what works best for you as a person. Um, but I, I've never seen anything convincing that says to me that people need these drugs to live the best lives they can. That's what I think. I also have a sneaking suspicion, just an intuition that this question was par- possibly asked by a parent worried about their kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and for that, I might suggest the work of Gabor Mate, um, especially his new book, The Myth of Normal. But I think that there's, you know, very often uh, psychiatric issues or con- the conventional wisdom of mental illness doesn't necessarily we line up with the timeline of something that has happened to someone. So if, you know, what, if something happened in your childhood that, you know, the learned response over time has, has created symptoms that classically fit into a mental illness diagnosis, well, is that a mental illness or is it something bad that happened to you when you're, when you were a kid? So 
I think if you can maybe take a step back and ask what happened to me or what happened to the child as opposed to what is wrong with them, you might start to unravel that question a little bit for yourselves because in my personal opinion, probably the vast majority of mental illness cases are actually a result of longstanding trauma or repetitive, you know, big T, one big T trauma or many little T dramas, you know, and repetitive change. And that can be dealt with. I mean, to me, that's power. Yeah. We can address that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, you look at when each of us got on medications and there was extenuating circumstances. You look at when a lot of people get on medications, there's some stuff going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, some heavy stuff, whether it's loss or uh, relocation or rejection or a relationship breakup. Um, you know, there's usually a lot of life circumstances that are very heavy that could be worked through with counseling, support, and lifestyle. Unfortunately, a lot of people are unwilling to pause life for a moment to do those things mm -hmm. or shake up the status quo. And so it's like, okay, tell you what, I got to be back at work like yesterday. How do I fix this right now? Um, you know, what, what pill can I take? And even if people aren't asking what pill they can take, someone's telling you, <laughs> you can take this pill. And you, mm -hmm. you maybe don't have to make these other changes, but I can tell you in the long run, you save a lot of time and pain, maybe just dealing with things in a different way from the get-go. Um, not that I wish my path had been different. Sometimes I wonder, mm -hmm. you know, if I had made different changes, lifestyle, um, counseling, how could it have been different? But that's not speaking with regret because I think like Gemma said, I believe everything happens for a purpose and my life was meant to play out in a certain way for maybe a purpose I'm living now. Uh, but 100% agree that there's a lot of other ways to deal with the stress and the loss and the grief and everything else in our lives. Yeah, I, I also think that there's there can be a lot of um, other contributing factors. Like for me, I have suspected ADHD, which I think throughout my life has has given me these thoughts and feelings and I've had it's made me extra sensitive to certain things which I think that that having known that if I when I was younger would have definitely been a big help so I think yeah obviously only being on the antidepressants for a short period of time it was easier for me to see what was normal for me mm. and what I was trying to get back to yeah, absolutely. Thank you all. I think we've just got time to squeeze a, a, a last one in. So um, someone's asking, do you think you can only heal once you're fully off the meds or do you think you heal as you go down? Do some people feel better as they go down? Do some people have an easier time tapering as they get lower or is it always harder? Uh, this is kind of an interesting question. I mean, the, the experience of tapering down varies. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of people... Some people have more issues. Some people have the same level of issues. Some people, it gets easier. I've seen that happen all three ways uh, before. But one thing that I, I kind of have kind of come to an unofficial conclusion is that it's it's probably a little easier to wait to do what's called shadow work, you know, like work on all the, on all the traumas or whatever. Um, I, I think maybe wait until you're fully tapered off just because not only do these drugs often have a blunting effect where you can't fully access the emotion or perhaps there's like literal memory issues. I had memory issues. I still, there's whole parts of my life that are gone, so I can't access it. Um, I'm not sure you can really go as deep as you need to. And especially if your nervous system is dysregulated, I kind of see personally no real sense to, you know, shake up the soda bottle, if you will. Um, because you kind of have enough going on. I mean, you can work on light things, I think, you know, self-compassion and grace and patience. But I tend to tell people, you know, if they're considering this, you know, the trauma work will always be there. So you can kind of wait for that if that's what feels right. That's my opinion there. Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, I'll jump in if that's okay. I think that um, obviously maybe the wholesale healing, the really big leaps and bounds are going to take place mm -hmm. when a person's totally off the medications. Um, but I also believe there's healing that happens as a person mm -hmm. goes down, because by definition, if the goal is to get your body and your mind used to incrementally lower and lower doses of the medication, then you're doing that mm -hmm. with each and every cut. 
and you're handling responsibilities with less of the medication, um, finding ways to calm yourself with less of the medication and, and so on and so forth. So I do think each step, you know, talking about victories, each step is a major victory to be celebrated in a taper. And I do believe there is some healing that happens as you're doing it as well. And I guess that's the way I think of it, because it's really going to help to encourage you to keep at the journey. Great, thank you. And um, Gemma, any thoughts on, on that one? Um, I think because I didn't taper, I don't, I, there's, yep. mine was just all after that. So like my tapering was like a week and a half. So I, I, like I can't really contribute to that part. I wouldn't advise that. I yeah. know I knew no different at the time. If I could go back, would I change it? I don't know. Yeah. It was what it was. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, as to that, you know, I've only got my own experience to draw on, but I'm pretty sure that healing starts from the second you make the commitment to be off the drug and with each subsequent little adjustment you make. And, you know, the, the, the experience gets worse and better. But, you know, once you, Michael mentioned it, once you kind of take control of your own destiny and say, right, I'm going to do this, it don't, doesn't matter how long it takes. You know, it, that you shouldn't beat yourself up if it takes a long time. It takes the time that it takes and you are doing the best you can at any one time. And that's the best that you can do. So no one's asking any more of you and you shouldn't ask more yeah. of yourself. But I'm convinced that healing starts from the time you make that decision. Yeah. Yeah, I, I am too, for, for to be clear, but sometimes we don't need to go into that, you know, big, deep thing. Like if we're already in crisis, we don't need to pile on more. But, yeah. you know, in, it's individual. I think that's the, the, the main takeaway from today is that you got to get in control of your own car and drive it at the speed that you're ready to drive it at. Good. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Mind the speed limits. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So we've got a couple of minutes to go. So um, thank you so much for the questions that you submitted. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Um, I, I, in Kind of in the last couple of minutes, really, I mean, firstly, I just want to thank the panel, Gemma, Michael, Brooke, for, for coming on to share your stories with us. It's, it's been really humbling, actually, to hear how you dealt with difficult circumstances. And it, it's been incredibly inspiring to hear how much progress you've all made and you know there's so many terms swelling around my brain now radical acceptance and being a warrior and celebrating the small victories and taking back control and you know all, all these things so um you know b before i kind of sum up you know i just wondered in the last minute or two whether any of you had any kind of closing thoughts yeah i, I can jump in quick i would just say um you know see what you're doing is valuable if you're in a process of tapering medications, or even if you've been off for a while, experiencing symptoms, working to get yourself healthier, to put that experience behind you, wherever you're at in the process, see what you're doing is valuable. Um, it's not useless pain. It's going to prove to be useful pain. Um, what you're doing is important. You know, maybe wrap it up into other goals that you have, other things you want to do in life and tell yourself, if I can see this through, get stronger, get myself to a place where well, or excuse me, where I feel better, I'm going to do such and such with my life or try such and such. Um, but don't ever downplay the importance of what you're doing. Um, it's not just some circumstances being thrown at you, uh, you know, by the nether regions out there. It's something that you can be consciously involved in as an active participant. So see what you're doing is valuable. Be patient with yourself. Be encouraging with yourself. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think it's so important to be passionate compassionate with yourself and don't overwhelm yourself because I've spoken to a lot of people going through withdrawal and they think that they should be in a certain place and it's it's not that type of process it's you you have to just sort of tunnel vision and just just hold on that's just all I'd say just hold on to hope and just don't give up thank you yeah, I would say, you know, for me, I got very specific about it. Um, I, I withdrawal is obviously different for everyone, but for me, it came in windows and waves. And when I was in a window, I thought I would never get, or when I was in a wave, I thought I'd never get better ever again. And when I was in a window, it's almost like I, you know, just thought maybe I was done. But what I, what I started to realize is that our brain and our body's hardwired to heal. If, you know, we're 90 years old, we cut ourselves it's going to heal up. And so for me, I started to internalize the idea that if I could feel good for one second, 
I could feel good for two. That one second was proof enough that I could feel good. My body could do it. So one second can become two, two can become 10, 10 can become a week and so on and so forth. So try and just remind yourself when you're in waves that you are capable of feeling good because you, you know, you've been there for at least a second at some point. So just remember that. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, as we come to the close, I uh, thank you all of you for attending and being with us today. It, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be able to share these discussions with you. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for engaging in the chat. I haven't been able to keep up with it, but it's been pretty incredible to see the discussion moving in real time. Thank you so much, Karina and Lucy. You both work incredibly hard running these events and keeping everything moving along. And in fact, I have to say, you know, the whole idea for this event was Karina's and it's been yeah. such a valuable and important chance to celebrate success so Karina thank you so much um, I know that Lucy has been sharing links in the chat so as a reminder both Madden America and IIPDW have resources available for those of you interested in withdrawal issues Madden America has a good review of withdrawal literature and we mentioned earlier IIPDW has an excellent video which gives some of the ins and outs of tapering it's available on their home page and it's it's really really worthwhile watching so um, just before we finish Karina did, do you want to mention the next event coming up? Um, yeah, we're putting together. Oh, and I'll mention it also if you want to donate to Madden America or IIPDW, Lucy will drop the links there because we operate completely off donations. Um, and yeah, the next panel, we're just working on it now. It'll likely be in August and it'll likely be a family panel for folks who have um children or family members who are going through um, different psychiatric issues. Um, so if you want to hear about that one, make sure to sign up for our newsletter. And Lucy will drop the link in the chat for that and all our other virtual events. And thank you so much. Yeah, the reason it was my idea is it was because these events, events like these are what got me through the darkest parts of withdrawal. So I hope that it helped you all today. And thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Gemma, Michael, Brooke, it was so, so great to hear of your experiences. And, you know, to everyone watching, you know, just just hold on. Just, you know, you, you will get where you want to be in time. I really believe that. Thank you.